Hello, everyone. Uh, good evening. My name is Rahul Verma. I work here at the Center for Policy Research. Uh, this talk today uh, with uh, Chil Vernier and Sanjay Kumar is in the second uh, of the series on how India votes. Uh, some of you attended the last talk, which was with uh, Pradeep Chibber and Rajdeep Sardesai, more sort of like as an opening uh, uh, event of this 24 cons lecture series or in conversation series to understand the complexities and nuances of Indian elections and India's party politics in the run up to 2024 election. And this is also to mark the 50th year occasion of Center for Policy Research. So in November, we complete uh, 50 years. And the idea behind this talk series is that every month we'll post three talks uh, and uh, culminating up to the final uh, in perhaps in April, May when the election results get announced. We do have some plans, like uh, I have some idea of uh, what the uh, talks are going to be in August, but if you have any suggestions that, uh, you know, what kind of topics we should pick up uh, and uh, who we should invite, of course, there are constraints, like to do the physical event, people have to be in Delhi. Uh, we are going to have some uh, 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 conversations solely on Zoom, so the next conversation with Mukulika Banerjee and Irfan Muruddin uh, is going to be on Zoom and not at CPR, but the plan is to have some conversations here uh, at CPR, so the building uh, remains to look uh, alive as it used to be a uh, few months ago. Anyways, without further ado, uh, thank you everyone who has joined uh, on Zoom and everyone who's here battling the rain and storms. Uh, that basically shows that Indian democracy is in good <laughs> health and spirit. Uh, let me introduce my uh, guest, uh, Professor Sanjay Kumar, is co-director of Lokniti. CSTS is also a professor at the Center for Study of Developing Societies. Uh, I know him for a very, very long time. I was trained uh, at Lokniti. I worked with him uh, before starting my PhD. And so thank you, Sanjayji, for being the guru. Uh, you have been for uh, all these years. Uh, and he's a regular columnist, writes on Indian elections, has several books on India's elections and voting behavior. Jill Vernier, another name, uh, 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 you know, Jill uh, is co-director of Director of co-director of Trivedi Center for Political Data at Ashoka University. He's also a senior fellow at Center for Policy Research, and this year is visiting at Amherst College uh, at United uh, States. Both of these, like the idea to get G and Sanjayji today was that both of these people have been working on data for a very, very long uh, period of time. Uh, Lokniti CSAS in some ways has pioneered, uh, if not pioneered, revived the art of uh, public uh, opinion polling in India. We did have some tradition going back to uh, 50s and then in 80s, Tanoi Roy uh, uh, revived it. And then uh, in 90s, Lokniti started doing this in a much more uh, academic and scholarly fashion. So Lokniti in some ways houses 30 years of worth of public opinion polling data uh, 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 in this country, and Jean uh, uh, managed to create this massive sort of like data enterprise where now we have constituency level estimates arriving to our email inboxes uh, on the day of counting. So by midnight, we have the complete uh, electoral results available to us. All of the, that data Jean has made uh, public. So it's a very, very important public service which has been recently recognized by American Political Science Association. They have given an award to the data set with Jean and Francesca Creed curated. And now that's a, uh, you know, uh, both these data sets are sort of integral or lifelines to many of us who study Indian elections. It's not possible to comment, uh, uh, you know, with some sense, like sensible comments. You can, of course, comment on Indian politics whenever you want, but uh, the kind of data these two institutions uh, have provided have been really, really helpful. And so what I'm going to do today is basically ask them a couple of questions. Uh, 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 both of them will uh, talk for seven, eight minutes and then a couple of questions based on their remarks. And meanwhile, faculty will send me questions from, so people who have questions who are on Zoom, you can send in your questions on chat box or Q&A. And my colleague Prakriti will, uh, uh, send it to me, and I'll also take questions uh, uh, here in the room. So let me start with you, Jean. Uh, the first question is, like, now that we have these massive data sets, of course, there are a lot of things that we have not yet answered, but we have become, like, we have some surety of, like, some 
the big patterns that have emerged from these consequency level estimates of candidate level uh, data that you have amassed over the years. And so if you can share three, four big data trends that uh, tells us both the complexities as well as nuances of Indian politics. Okay, thank you. And then thank you, Raul, for the uh, invitation. So I'll, I'll answer to your um, question, but what I wanted to uh, do today also is not just to give you some sort of an idea and oversight of what kind of new data is available, because for one, as you said, that data is publicly available, so it's all for everyone to uh, see. But to look at you know a couple of you know major insights that we can derive from the descriptive you know statistics that we can get out of that uh, data, and and perhaps later in the conversation get into how we can use those insights, those trends, not just as a way to uh, describe politics, describe political uh, uh, trends, but also to think about uh, politics and how we can integrate data into the way we think about um, politics. And so um, as far as the data is concerned, it's true that today we have data that we did not have uh, access to uh, before. The affidavit data, uh, which is put together by ADR, cast data, uh, which has been collected over many years by uh, successive uh, teams, initially working with uh, you, Sanjay, and, and Christophe Jaffalo in the CSDS, and later on with me, and again, Christophe Jaffalo and, and, and the TCPD team in Sciences Po. Uh, we have data on politicians' career trajectories, uh, again, put together by TCPD uh, through the coding of a unique identification number for every contestant to every state or national election uh, held in India since 1952. Um, we have the coding of candidates' religion or of gender that helps us track um, Muslims or women's representation in the Lok Sabha and, and in state um, assemblies. And, and these data can service you know, multiple purposes, right? Uh, we can measure the evolution of representation of various groups in the Lok Sabha and in state uh, assemblies. One trend that we observed pretty early on in 2014 onwards is that uh, they, uh, wherever the BJP made uh, electoral gains, it was accompanied by a strong uh, resurgence of um, upper caste representation. Um, by uh, 2024, sorry, sorry, by 2014, upper caste representation in the Lok Sabha goes back to pre mandal levels. Uh, something similar happens in, in important states like UP or, or, or Madhya Pradesh. And after, before 2019 and after 2019, we see, you know, the BJP trying to serve, give some sort of course correction to uh, that uh, trend by providing marginally more representations to uh, non-dominant segments of OBCs, particularly in, in, in the Hindi belt. But the state of an over-representation uh, of uh, traditional elites in, in assemblies and in the Lok Sabha um, remains one of the important trends uh, of these past uh, years. Uh, another important trend, which is uh, an enduring one, it's the extremely slow progress in women's representation in, again, nationally and in state assemblies. Uh, women make 14% of women in the Lok Sabha, uh, and and eight percent, only eight percent of MLAs uh, across um, all uh, states. Uh, we find that no major party, except Trinamool, and to a lesser degree the Biju Janata Dal, have made significant efforts to improve uh, women's representation uh, in um, India. Um, something else that we can also measure is the uh, gradual disappearance of uh, Muslims representatives in um, elective um, assemblies. So we know that the BJP hardly nominates any Muslim candidates in national and state elections. In fact, I was looking at the data this morning um, to see that it's not exactly entirely the case. Uh, by all numbers, since 2008, um, the BJP has fielded 177 Muslim candidates out of 10,000 candidates in total for every election that have occurred since 2008. Half of them are in Assam and, and Jammu and Kashmir. Half of them were uh, nominated before um, 2014. 11 of them got elected, mostly uh, in Assam and, and, and Rajasthan, but the overall 
broad trend is that uh, the one party that is dominant uh, in, in national politics is actually effectively excluding um, minorities from representation. But what the data shows also is that the marginalization of Muslims in elected assemblies predates the recent rise of uh, the BJP and other parties are also uh, representative, uh, also responsible for it. And so the data that we have, these you know, descriptive inside these trends on representation, uh, they, they, they can serve all kinds of useful descriptive purposes, but they can also be very useful to critically uh, assess claims made by political parties, uh, for instance, about uh, political inclusion, right? Or they can be useful to uh, question general claims that are made about political transformation in um, India. If we take incumbency, for example, right, uh, uh, we know that more and more governments and chief ministers succeed in getting reelected. That's, this, this is something that actually Sanjay has uh, documented and analyzed in, in great detail. But at the same time, if you look at constituency level data, we see that um, individual incumbency remains very high across states and across parties. Most politicians' careers in India are very short. In 2019, 50% of MPs had been elected for the first time. In 2014, it was 59%. Across state assemblies in the last electoral cycle, the average ratio of first-time MLAs is 48%, so nearly half. So that's a huge turnover, which is really observed in, 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 in established democracies. Right, and most incumbents actually don't get to rerun. Those who rerun have a low probability of getting reelected. In UP, for example, if you ever get elected in UP, roughly you stand 25% chance of serving a second term, which are pretty low uh, odds, particularly when you consider the cost of entry into politics in, 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 in the first time, right? So what does it mean that it means that Parties or governments re-election often hide large losses of, of seats, but local volatility also means that when a party loses a lot of seats, it also wins a lot of seats that it did not help you know, um, previously. So you have a huge volatility at the constituency level, which is something that we know now also happens at the boot level, thanks to the data gathered by uh, Pradeep Chiber. And, and, and Francesca uh, Jensenius on boot level um, returns. Um, it basically means that while more and more governments get reelected, they do so, but with different people, right? And, and, that, and that's an example of how we can use data to sort of build up insights uh, into, into politics. This rapid turnover of uh, elected representatives uh, becomes a measure or can be used as a measure of power concentration in um, Indian uh, in, in Indian um, politics, right? Uh, most individual MPs, most uh, individual MLAs uh, do not actually benefit from the reconnection or the re-election of their own um, governments, right? Um, And um, another claim that is made, and, and I was talking just earlier about, about um, inclusion. Uh, when we talk about inclusion or the diversification of political recruitment by political parties, it's usually based on an assessment of caste-based representation, right? This is the marker of diversity for assemblies and also for political parties. And it is true that uh, for the most part, may, most major parties, including the BJP, have broadened their uh, pool of uh, recruitment of, 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 of candidates, not necessarily in ways that alter the balance of power between groups within those parties, but nonetheless, descriptively speaking, there is greater diversity on the basis of caste across major uh, political parties. But if you look at nearly every other sociodemographic uh, variable that is available, what we see is that the political class is becoming slightly more, on the one hand, it's becoming more diverse on the basis of caste, but it's also more and more homogeneous and elitist at the same time on almost every other um, criteria, right? If you look at wealth, for example, 
asset, asset data. We see candidates becoming richer and richer across the board, across parties, across uh, states. If we look at data for the last three electoral cycles, that's about 52,000 candidates for 88 elections. Um, we see that the, the rate of wealth increase of major parties candidates uh, accounting for outliers, the, the very, very rich ones or the very, very indebted ones, um, is 137% uh, in the last uh, five years and almost 200% uh, in, in the previous uh, cycle. If you isolate the MLAs, those numbers are even, uh, are even, even, even greater. This is a, uh, not only it is it is an upward trend of of enrichment of uh, of, of candidates, but it, it's 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 actually an extraordinarily uh, fast uh, increasing um, phenomenon. We uh, basically it means that uh, between 2013 and 2018, candidates have, across parties again and across states have become twice as rich as they were in the previous uh, cycle. Um, definitely beating inflation. And so we also know that more and more candidates declare some form of business as occupation against agriculture or law in, 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 in the past, right? And so what do we do with this kind of information, right? It's one thing to sort of, sort of you know, observe those trends, uh, but what we can do is think in terms of implications. What are the consequences for, um, for, for politics? Right, uh, changes in political recruitment have raised the bar for non-wealthy candidates. The cost of entry into politics exponentially increases election after uh, election. Um, these costs adversely affect representation of the poor women minorities. And by the way, this is a phenomenon that affects every state, including states where money did not play such a large role in, in state politics. Uh, in the past. That's the case for most of the Northeast, for example. Uh, Northeast politicians and candidates are not as wealthy as they are in Karnataka or Andhra Pradesh or Maharashtra, for sure. But the rate of increase is actually among, um, among the um, fastest, right? And so the image that it depicts is that of a political class that is actually quite elitist, quite homogeneous, fairly undifferentiated between parties because parties more or less major parties adopt similar strategies. They target the same candidate. They, they pull their candidates from the same or similar pool of recruitment, which may vary caste wise, but tends to be very uh, similar on other, um, other, um, other variables. And this becomes even more interesting when you put this information side by side with what survey data tell us. Right? Survey data tell us that women and poor voters have a say in the determination of electoral outcomes, right? Uh, but they're not getting, but all data shows that they're not getting representation for it. In the recent Karnataka election, the narrative was that Congress succeeded in mobilizing the poor by and large. But yet, if you look at the Congress candidate, uh, not only were they very rich, but they were considerably richer than the BJP candidates. Mm -hmm. Even the incumbent uh, BJP MLAs who had all opportunities to raise funds uh, for their campaigns uh, over, the past, um, over the past few years. And so the idea that the profile of candidates somewhat matches the profile of the electoral base of parties does not really hold true. And there is, I see, a growing disconnect between electoral behavior uh, the uh, party support and, 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 and representation. Most Indians do not belong to, group, belongs to groups that do not get representation. A very few large castes get representation. Uh, groups that are demographically relevant get a handful of representatives, but that does not necessarily translate into a lot of power of leverage within the parties that are willing to um, accommodate uh, to um, accommodate them. Um, the last trend that I wanted to uh, talk about is um, this idea of power concentration, right? We see this extraordinary turnover of politicians and it would be tempting to interpret that as a sign of you know, elite circulation of elite renewal. After all, it's not necessarily a bad idea not to be stuck with the same people in power for a very long time. But what this volatility of representation uh, or this high turnover uh, basically amounts to 
is an extraordinary degree of power concentration uh, in, 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 in few hands uh, in uh, Indian politics. In 2019, in the Lok Sabha, there were only 112 MPs who, have be, who had been elected more than twice. Uh, only 12 of them were women. Think about what it means in a country of 1.4 billion people to only have 12 women who can be actually described as career politicians in, nation, in, in, in national parliaments, right? There are women in different in their parties and assemblies, et cetera, but in, in the national parliament. Right across assemblies, less than thirty percent of all MLAs uh, on average have been elected more than twice. There are variations, but they're not enormous. And so, if you look at who are these thirty percent, those people who last in politics, who succeed in in getting reelected, who beat even who win when even their party lose, of course they include party leaders. In many instances, their uh, it includes their relatives a few local bosses who keep winning, some of the wealthier candidates who have the resources to survive in politics. Some of them, of course, are also effective politicians who get reelected because of their work. But if you look at their composition, they tend to be even more elite, more upper caste uh, in their compositions or more, they belong more to dominant um, intermediary caste for states like Karnataka or Andhra Pradesh, and they count very, very few women. And so that we see, and I'll end here, uh, Rahul, is that um, greater caste inclusion can coexist with a homogeneous elitist political class in a system where power gets concentrated in, 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 into a few hands. And so the data is useful to detect a trend like this, but in order to explain it, to explain the why and the how, we need actually much more than data. Data is just you know, a point of departure. Uh, thank you, Jeev. Uh, so if I understand you correctly, uh, what you pointed out, looking at this candidate profile, both in terms of class, class, gender, and religion, that there is on some levels, some diversity uh, is, is uh, happening, but still power remains concentrated uh, in, in few hands. What is much more interesting for me, like the, uh, that politics seems to be the, uh, like, most risky startup, right? Because uh, uh, once it's very, very costly to enter the market, even when you enter, the chances of you succeeding is very low. Mm -hmm. And even if you succeed once, the chance of you basically succeeding twice is very low. So anyone who's thinking of a political startup, beware, you may lose money. Uh, with that, let me ask Sanjayji to basically, you know, use your sort of bank on uh, survey data and what big trends we have noticed about public opinion in the country. Uh, Rahul, before mentioning things on what are the big trends, uh, let me start by saying uh, what is the problem with the use of data in election or politics? I think the problem is, uh, and this is based on my experience dealing with the research students in the universities and the journalists, either you are ignorant about data Second, you don't want to use the data. And third, the bigger problem is people are choosy about using the data. I got a call from a journalist last evening. And the question which was being posed, and I want, and the journalist wanted me to explain. And what was that question? Why regional parties, and the example was being given about Samajwadi party, why regional parties are unable to hold on to its allies while BJP has been able to hold on to its allies. So I said, but where is the evidence? Have you looked at the data? Look at 2022 assembly elections in, so the journalist was referring to you know, the recent people, recent parties, smaller parties who have left Samajwadi party. So I, I asked the journalist to just compare, look at the data, look at how many parties had aligned with Samajwadi party in 2022, how many are, with Samajwadi party at the moment and look, go back 2014 and go back 2019 and look at the situation five, two months before. Don't look at two, uh, July 18th. So look at the data to figure out whether BJP has been able to hold on to its allies or Samajwadi party or regional party has been hold on to its allies. The journalist kept saying, Main dekh lunga. I will refer the data but please tell me the explanation. I said, but why do I explain? Please 
refer the data first. So the problem is we don't look, we don't try to look at the data. What is data meant for? It is an evidence. First look at for first correct your evidence. So there are two approaches of I think using the data. One is what I call the top-down approach and the bottom-up approach. The problem of the data at the moment with regard to elections, whether it is for research students or with journalists, top-down approach. I have a story ready. I have already written the story. You generally get a call around this time. Every day I will get four or five calls. I have already written a story. Can you give me some data to support my story? This is the top-down approach. Researchers also, not only journalists, young researchers. I'm not blaming them. This is maybe poor training, poor training. So I have already written my thesis. I have already done my work. I have done, I have my story ready. And the story is that BJP is holding on to its allies and Samajwadi party is not holding to, on to its allies. So what, why regional parties don't, are unable to hold this. So I, so the prop, this is the bottom uh, top down approach that I have my story ready. Give me the data to support my story. If you give the data, which doesn't support the story, then the date problem must be in the data. The problem is not in my thinking. That's a big problem with the election data, usage of data, very, very selective. What should be the approach? The approach should be bottom of approach. And I keep saying, just leave aside your own ideas, own thought. And I kept telling this journalist, finally, finally, after 20 minutes, I had to tell the journalist, you are, I have never said this to any journalist, you are biased. You are, whenever I'm offering an explanation, you are giving me a counter explanation. And the biasness was that BJP is as the glue, regional parties don't have the glue. So I kept saying, leave aside your, you know, perceptions, you, your ideas. Look at the data and then build your story. That is about bottom-up approach. Look at the data, build your stories around that. Don't have the story ready. So what is data useful for? I think the data is very, very important. Not for a top-down approach, or it is important for a bottom-up approach. Look at the data and then try to build your stories, whether you know, party is holding on, party is not holding on, what is happening, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, Why is survey data important? I will be very brief. Why is survey data important? There are different kinds of data. Jill has already mentioned about the aggregate data. And I will give you one small example. You know, constituencies are reserved for Dalits, Adivasis, and there are constituencies, whether assembly constituencies or Lok Sabha constituencies, where sizable number of Muslim population is there. So the, what the story will go on, okay, out of you know, 80 constituencies in UP, assembly constituency, where Muslims are in sizable numbers, maybe 20% plus, 30% plus, BJP has managed to win 70 out of that or 60 out of that. The story goes on and big national dailies and big television channel. Muslims have voted in favor of BJP because BJP has won 70 out of 80 Muslim constituencies where Muslims are in sizable number. And that applies to Dalit vote also. So Dalits are in sizable number, similar, same data. Okay, 80 constituency reserved for Dalits, 61 by BJP, which means Dalits have all voted for BJP. It is important to, because people do ask this question, ki aap, why do you keep doing this analysis about caste by vote, caste by vote? Is there nothing else in the survey data? I keep saying there are lots and lots of things in the survey data, but this is important. This is important because unless until you have this evidence, because in most of the constituencies, what happens is that, and there are evidences for that, for, uh, for that, and the evidences are from the survey data that in Dalit reserve constituencies, which has been won by BJP in much bigger number, lesser number of Dalits voted in favor of BJP and non-reserve constituencies, maybe more Dalits voted in favor of BJP. So unless until you have this kind of a survey data, we are building a wrong notion. We are building a wrong story about the support base of political parties. This is so along with the aggregate data, survey data becomes very, very important. 
unless until we have this data, we won't be able to figure out what happened in these constituencies, Muslim constituents, sizable number of Muslim population. Uh, Rahul's question is about, you know, what are the few big things which we have noticed from the survey data? There is a lot of talk about these days about the women vote. We all know from the election commission data that women turnout has gone up. We would never get an answer why to this question, why this may have happened. And if we are looking at women turnout has gone up, but who are these women? Is it more among the educated women, more among the rural women, more among young, more among you know, different sections of women? Where do you get this data from? This data, this evidence will come from the survey data. Also, why women may have, why we see increasing turnout. If we ask carefully designed questions in the survey, we may be able to come closer to that. I'm not saying that you will get the truth. I'm not saying that from the survey data, you get all the truth. You come closer to that. Uh, youth, I must tell you that young voters, election commission has a lot of focus about mobilizing the young voters. They don't have a sense. They, they are getting a sense that yes, turnout has gone up. If you compare it from say 2009 to 2014, it has gone up by 8%, 9%. But they don't have an idea whether young voters have the turnout of young voters has increased or not. From the survey data, we did come up with the findings that if we look at the turnout of young voters from 96 till 2009 Lok Sabha election, the turnout of young voters in the age group of 18 to 25 has been roughly 4 or 5% less compared to the average turnout. So if the average turnout is 60%, young voters turnout was roughly about 55-56%. 2014 election witnessed a huge jump. 66% national turnout, young voters turnout was 68%. It surpassed by 2%, the average turnout, which means a huge jump. While it was trailing by 4 or 5%, jump by 2 per, it crossed the average turnout. Election commission has no idea about this. And I must tell you that by the then election commissioner, we were invited because you know, like these things came up in the newspaper and he was more interested in more details about that. state mein kitna hua hai. So they were more interested in the chap and they were, they were feeling happy. But we have done a lot of effort. We wanted to mobilize people. So that's another uh, story about that. There could be lots and lots of stories. Kind, I will give two more examples and then I will stop. One is about uh, Modi factor in Indian elections. We keep think, talking about, and very strong critic would say, Agar Modi nahi hai na, Narendra Modi nahi hai, to BJP kuch bhi nahi hai. BJP to khatam. Kuch loo kaya nahi, itna to nahi hai. But Modi is a vote catcher. So, range of ideas. BJP survives only because of Modi. Other range is, no, no, BJP has become powerful. Modi is a factor, etc. We in the survey, both in 2014 election and 2019 election, we wanted to quantify that. So we did ask question about you know, how much impact Modi has. We did not ask this question, but we had an idea about what, how to ask the question. And we figured out that in 2014, of every 100 vote which BJP got, roughly 27 votes were contributed by Prime Minister Naren Modi to BJP. So roughly about range of... 25. When I say 27, I don't claim here 27 EN. Always a margin of error. It, so we get a sense of one quarter of BJP's vote is contributed by Prime Minister Modi to BJP. And in 2019, we got the sense that it, it has gone up by to roughly about 33%. One third of the BJP was, vote was contributed by Narendra Modi. There are several questions of that kind which survey data helps us to understand come bring us closer to what may be the real situation on the ground. So I think there are lots and lots of questions. So don't think that the survey data is only about who voted for whom. Kis jati ne kisko vote diya. And many people criticize us and people who do this kind of an analysis. And people say you have reduced election all to cast by vote. It's not only about cast by vote. There are lots and lots of nuances uh, which comes out from the survey data. 
So Rahul, I will stop here. Thank you, Sanjay ji. Uh, and just to add, because I've worked on local TV data a lot and public opinion data in general, like uh, some of, most of the questionnaires of local is available on their website. You should go and check. Like these are 20 page long questionnaires uh, where you are asked about how many times a day you pray and uh, what do you eat and what is your opinion on uh, hundreds of things, right? And, 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 and many of us have been using that kind of data to understand politics in general. So uh, elections, like these election survey data are not just about forecasting elections, which is one thing, of course, some of us uh, enjoy doing that. Uh, it's our uh, sport. Uh, but other than that, not him, I, I do. Uh, but other than that, it's like uh, these data are, is very, very useful in terms of understanding large trends about Indian election. With that, I also want to add a key caveat, which is, Three of us work on data, but we don't say data is everything about politics, right? If you want to understand what's unfolding and even in data, you need to be on the ground. Your ears have to be on the ground. Uh, so uh, perhaps if you can't go on the ground, you should have friends who are going on the ground and you should speak to them. Of course, none of this has to be taken at face value. So you should listen to all kinds of views and voices. People who are doing ethnographic work on the ground is very, very important because they can give you the details and, and the juice of what, what's happening on the ground. Journalists interview politicians, right? So there are, data is one way of looking at election. It's not the only way uh, of looking at election. With that, let me, uh, you know, first bring in Jeel and then Sanjay ji. Uh, of course, we talked about the usefulness of data, as Sanjay also elaborated, how it helps us in, like, you know, not cooking up the story, but actually finding what the story is. Uh, uh, so beyond the usefulness, what's the limitations of these kind of uh, 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 data sets that you're talking about? And two, if you, like, in the last conversation, you talked about mostly about candidate level sort of, like, uh, uh, characteristics. Did you have any sense of what, Constituency level, for example, you hinted at volatility. Are there other such trends that you can uh, hint at? Yeah. Well, one of the limitation of the data, and and it's not of you know, it's not data's fault, or it's not you know those who produce or handle the data's fault, which is that it does not contain the answer to or the question that it helped raise, right? Uh, I mean, Sanjay, you gave a number of you know, perfectly relevant examples about the increase in women turnout or the increase of, you know, your uh, youth turnout. Uh, the data will just tell you that this seems to be happening, but uh, it will not, you know, help you. Uh, it will not help you, you know, figure out why. And so if you put data at the beginning and at the end of your analysis, uh, you're not going to go, you know, you're not going to go, um, you're not going to go very far. All the risk is that you are going to take um, data at, at at face value. So I've I've mentioned this the cast composition of parties and the BJP in, in the event. And if you look at face value, yes, there is an increase of groups that were seldom represented, you know, in the past in 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 in, in politics and and um and um and and that's the base of the claim that the BJP made that it's become this umbrella, you know, so uh, party. Uh, almost that they, they claim to become an OBC party and so forth. But if you look at um, reality and if you look at you know, the persistence of overrepresentative upper caste, if you look at distribution of power, if you look at uh, allocation of portfolios in the cabinet, if you look at you know, the internal dynamics within the party, and you see that you know, the, the overall balance of power has not uh, really, really changed. But if you don't have an ear on the ground, you don't, of course, you don't get to see that. And you only stick to what the data seem to be saying at, at face uh, value. Data on its own is not only insufficient, but it can also be in some cases misleading if you don't combine that with information that you gather um, that you gather um, elsewhere. And You wanted to know another another trend, um, you know, that that we observe is so. I've mentioned this rapid turnover. I've mentioned the fact that candidates are, you know, wealthier and and, and wealthier, and 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 your reaction was, you know, what sense does it make, you know, to even get into this game when 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 the probability, the odds are, are you know, so badly uh, staked. Uh, you know, against 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 aspiring politicians or young politicians. Uh, but it tells you that the system creates a certain kind of incentives that will draw a certain kind of candidates. 
who not only have the resources, but also the belief that they can actually weather those risks, right? And that in itself sort of shortened down the selections to a particular type of individuals, right? Not just, you know, risk-taking political entrepreneurs, but, you know, people who also know that should, you know, the gamble succeed, the gains are going to be yeah. enormous, which also tends to be supported by the data mm -hmm. when you look at the, uh, not just the wealth of candidates, but the, the enrichment of uh, representatives after, uh, after they get uh, elected. And that is underreported data. And that's absolutely underrepresented, uh, underreported data. But again, you know, uh, there's a distribution of uh, dishonesty in, mm -hmm. in, in reporting. And so if you look at the trend, you know, overall, we can, we can, we can yeah. see the trend, right? Um, another common mistake is to uh, look at data about uh, uh, look at data for one particular election and actually disregard the past or, or, or forget about the past. Mm. And so there is great. I mean, every party that comes to power makes the claim of great novelty. They have invented a new forms of doing politics. When you look at the kind of social coalitions that the BJP has built or an effort to sort of open its ranks slightly on the margins to non-dominant BJP group, that's exactly what the BJP did in the early 2000s, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but of course, they don't want you to remember that version of the BJP. Everything has to be new. And if it's, especially if it succeeds, it has to be credited to, you know, the same two individuals. Well, one individual, but, you know, and another one as well. And, and, and so... If you don't cultivate uh, uh, a memory uh, or, or, or a sense of history, uh, you lose actually a lot of insight. One of the great advantages and one of the great contribution that CSDS has done is to create this timeline of data where we can see responses to questions over a long period of time, right? Uh, all these efforts at polling, trying to predict election, all that data actually vanishes the moment the, the, the results are, uh, are declared, right? Because most of that effort is geared only to try to predict, you know, two weeks in advance, you know, how the, how the, how the distribution of seats is going to be. As far as I'm concerned, I can wait for two weeks. You know, I, there are plenty of other things that I can do. I can read a novel, I can go for a walk, I can, you know, and I, I, can, I can actually wait for actual real data to come you know, on my desk and, and I can work, you know, and I can work with that. And so using data is fine, but uh, always look at context, look at, you know, what data is available for previous elections, always put the information that you have into a timeline. That's when the trends start appearing. Then you know if you have something new to say or if it's just business as usual. No, thank you, Jill. I think we are just different personalities. Even when I watch cricket, I basically love to look at the probabilities of winning. So on Google, right, uh, you don't have to run a model. Like on Google, just type the match which is going on. And with every success, it will keep telling you the changing probability of who's going to win. Uh, so it's just fun. Uh, yeah, but I, tr <laughs> I trust more the science in the yeah. cricket than in elections. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, but no, uh, thank you for uh, uh, mentioning those uh, uh, limitations in the data. And I completely agree with you, right? Like uh, without the sociological, political, and historical imagination, uh, it's hard to, uh, uh, you know, uh, put a sort of story to these uh, numbers and data, right? Uh, of, of course, often we get this criticism, which is like you are reducing human emotions and those kind of things, to just abstract numbers, but that's not the idea. You're putting a lot of these historical, political, sociological uh, learnings uh, behind, uh, 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 you know, uh, interpreting these terms. You wanted to say something? No, it's just a point of departure. Yeah. No. Thank you. Uh, so Sanjay Ji, what like, you know, especially with uh, survey data, because it comes under lots of criticism, uh, of course, uh, uh, one side of the story is this uh, TV business where you have seed forecasting, but you and I know that uh, these data gets used for many, many more things. But what are the limitations of, of, of survey data in understanding politics and uh, democracy in general? I think the big limitation is uh, if you anybody want to collect reliable data using a method, then it's very, very difficult to collect a large quantity of data. These days, I keep listening, meeting people who say, Mera sample teen lakh ka, do lakh ka. And I keep saying, ki, bhai, mujh, 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 sample karte karte, meri kamar jati hai. Meri, matlab, puri team ki. 
very very difficult so the limitation the limitation is that with the data we are able to present a big picture but we miss out the nuances so that's the limitation people who have a very large sample they claim that they have a very large sample they may be having a very large sample they have that advantage but i must say they have there are lots and lots of problem of, with such kind of a very large data set so one big limitation is you get the big picture but you miss out on nuances and people would say aapne to ye kaha ki dalit was what has shifted from xyz party but mere gaon mein chal ke dekhiye come to my village main aapko dikhata hu mere pados ke gaon mein yes those nuances are missed out because with the data you get a and that is the whole point of doing survey where is survey useful survey is a useful tool if you are looking at the your local of study is very large numerically geographically so you get a big picture that i think is the big limitation of survey data i think more than limitation i think there is a bigger challenge the big challenge is that these days so many various kinds of data sets multiple kind multiple data sets come into public domain especially with regard to politics especially with regard to elections and then it becomes very very difficult to even figure out which one i should use it i think that's a big challenge it's not the limitation that it's a challenge for uh, people using the data which one you use because many people many organization who have collected the data don't give you the details so that's the challenge the other challenge is and most of the things i'm i'm i have not i'm not the journalist story i have not cooked up it's a real story i and the real story is again i came across a survey of two questions and the two questions made a headline big splash headline of a national daily two question survey hmm. i don't want to name those questions questions bas do hi simple questions you like prime minister modi or not or you like the government or not and the two question survey so shortcuts of collection of data that is a big challenge multiply multiplicity of data with all kinds of shortcuts i think that's a big challenge uh, which is coming in the way of in in survey data i think i would stop no. here uh, so thank you sanjay ji uh, before so i'll take uh, first audience questions here and then prakriti will keep sending me questions uh, from zoom uh, so i'll take four questions but something that i wanted to add uh, uh, not just on the limitation but complexity of collecting and managing data i don't think people realize this we often get accused that you all sit in ac rooms of course in delhi seat you need ac uh, but you know like when 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 the survey data comes in i worked at uh, uh, lokniti and i've uh, uh, collaborated with ji sends me data it is lot of work uh, 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 just sort of like collecting that kind of information like a team is on the field uh, you get all kinds of uh, problems surveys and all kinds of data collection is very very expensive it costs you a lot of money there are always going to be small mistakes just like like managing uh, hundreds and thousands of rows uh, while the data is getting clean so yes we are sitting in the room but when we are sitting in the room we are working really really hard to make sure uh, that data looks uh, 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 you know much more clean and and, and manageable <clears throat> i think one limitation and which is where i also want to congratulate both your organizations and your own individual efforts i think what you were mentioning about the journalist example what we don't have in this country and in most political science departments across the country is some sort of like uh courses that integrate uh, uh uh teaching and learning uh of uh, uh data and so both lokniti has been doing this summer school where they teach uh, uh uh using like analyzing indian politics using data uh jeel has been conducting some of these things at tcpd neelan uh, nilanjan who works here has uh, uh, you know on and off been doing uh, some of these things so we all are in, in some ways trying to create sort of like platforms where people can uh come and learn data of course now youtube is bringing you everything on your laptop so please use that but you know we are always available individually if you ever want to uh get any help on understanding uh any data with that let me take three or four questions and then uh, please keep your questions short and brief i just want to ask please very interesting Deep. so he said something about uh sorry he said something about the complexity of the data 
So he talked about the Google. So I will tell you why the human intelligence is validated by the AI. So there is something called now image generation, something called a mid journey. So it is about the prompt that you give to the mid journey that creates an image. So his going to the survey becomes complex because of the, his questions are basically the prompt that answer give is given by the samples. Mm -hmm. So finally, if AI is confirming to some human intelligence mm -hmm. at the end of the day, that is being proven. So his surveys are more complex because he has to make his prompt engineering very, very fine. You give a mid journey, a simple prompt, mm -hmm. it gives you a shitty image. You give work on the prompt, it gets a, a good yeah, absolutely so yeah. that's great work sanjay is doing and i am again a fan i do much of the work in data and that's a great thing what sanjay is calling and that's why he's able to call upon on 400 500 sample size i was also worried but when i looked into the questions and when i was trying to generate some images from the mid journey alas came the idea and i thought that you i don't do attend when he is there and I'm coming from Indore to attend this conference here. Great. Thank you, sir. So, Thank you. So great much. thing. So let's let's take four questions. Please keep your questions short and brief. Uh, Sanjeev, uh, we'll take four to answer them. Hi. Uh, I have a like explanatory question for Jill. Uh, what's the voters side of the story about uh, the trend of uh, increase increasingly wealthy legislators? Like why do poor people keep voting for these rich candidates? Is it because of uh, scriptive affiliation or is it because those successful candidates uh, tend to do redistribution even though they are wealthy themselves? Thank you. Shri, uh, and I need one woman to ask question. Yeah, the state? Name it, at least three of us are <laughs> My question is for Dr. Kumar. You cautioned against the approach of force-fitting data to support your argument under the top-down approach. But in contrast, under a bottom-up approach, uh, the data set is varied, multidimensional. So the questions I ask for the data under bottoms up, that itself, that itself underlies, uh, I mean, kind of connotes certain kind of filters or biases of mine as a researcher questioner, that what questions I'm asking of the data. Accordingly, I'll filter the data. So that is also that caveat, if you could respond to that. Uh, she, she, uh, uh, just a brief question to both speakers. Sanjay ji referred to how the, we have so many uh, surveys and so many pollsters and most of them are not transparent about their methodology. Mm -hmm. Is there any, I mean, you would name who are transparent. I mean, apart from giving sample size and saying I have such a big sample size, uh, how many of them are actually transparent about their methodology, how they conduct the survey? One more question, but I'll request. Uh, oh, any more questions? I want to See, my, my response to your question is that you said we try and filter out good or bad survey, the quality, based on our own hypothesis, based on our own understanding. Don't do that. Try to filter out good or bad surveys looking into the methodological details. That is what you need. And that is also connected to Shri's question. That is the problem. As I said, oh, this survey is good because what I had thought this survey endorses that. So I will pick up this and I will reject all others. Look at the methodological details. Mm -hmm. That's very, very important. Uh, and But that's also a challenge in a sense. Cha cha limitation or challenge. People don't give out methodological details. Yeah. It's uh, actually, it's a good term rule to know if data that you find um, online or elsewhere is uh, reliable, is, are they transparent about how the data was constituted in, in, in the first place? Are they transparent about methodology? Uh, do they provide, do they provide access or not to uh, the questionnaire? The easiest thing in the world is to design uh, a questionnaire full of leading questions, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, do you think that uh, immigration should be prioritized over saving social security? No, the, you know? uh, the um, better formulation of a biased question, don't you think that migration should be completely stopped? Yes, yeah. no. Yes, no, exactly. It's a leading question. Yeah, no, exactly. So if you don't have access to that, that you don't know, you know, you don't know, you don't know the recipe, you don't know how, you know, the data has been, has been, has been, has been prepared. And, 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 and that's where you should become really critical, if not suspicious of the data. 
on your question on why to vote to keep voting for which candidate, there are several possible answers, right? One actually is uh, provided by survey data that shows that by and large, you know, voters tend to be more uh, motivated by party than you know to the candidates, right? The party effect tend to be quite strong uh, because the candidate roughly sixty five percent, roughly sixty five percent, and and that has also to do with the fact that candidates are by and large interchangeable, right? And 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 very often they actually literally do you know are interchanged between parties and with the ten polls, etc., right? On another possible answer is that while they don't really have a choice, we also know again from surveys that uh, most Indian voters would rather uh, they have their vote to be effective, right? They 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 they, they would aspire to um, vote for someone who has a fighting chance of actually winning the uh, election, and so that actually reduces the choice between candidates selected by major parties. The cumulative vote share of major party candidates has gone up, 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 you know, election after election. It's above, you know, 90% now in most elections. Whereas in the past, uh, candidates could get actually a sizable uh, share uh, of, of the vote. We see that vote share, you know, reduced. And so, first and, and, but first and foremost, perhaps, candidates have no say in determining who the candidates become. And the way I put it is that very often the actual electoral competition is not so much in front of voters, but it's through the informal primary system that parties have created in order to select candidates. And there, and then Rahul actually is better equipped than me to answer, you know, this part that parties have, you know, various techniques, how they recruit their candidates. But across parties, it is a hugely uh, competitive and expensive expensive process, process. People spend years investing into becoming a candidate. And then eventually, if they get the chance to get a ticket, then, you know, and they, own, they, they start spending for their own actual campaign, right? And so you have all these competitive pressure creates that filtering effect, which means that uh, these are the logics that guide over the selection of candidates, but candidates are never appointed by, you know, popular demand. Uh, so I, I agree with your question. Uh, and there is a poor literature on data generating process. Now, it actually depends on you as a researcher, uh, what kind of data generating process you want to follow. Are you trying to learn something? In that case, you're going to design your questionnaire in this case of survey data or anything to basically produce results from which you can learn about how the world is working. Or you want to be a propaganda activist Right, and in that case, you are going to follow more sort of like some of the leading questions they were hinting at, right? Because say, if you are an uh, activist who wants to do something about migration policy, uh, you could be a researcher, try to know how the thing is working on, or you can actually uh, ask a question which helps the your story and narrative. So, data generating process is very very important how the data was generated, and in that sense, the transparency of both either sort of like constituency level estimates and how things are done uh, uh, is very important. And so both these people, like if you'll go to Lokniti's website or TCPD's website, with every data set they have released, there's a large code book, right? How each things were done, how many locations people went, how many days they were trained, uh, how many female investigators were there, how many male investigators were there. So as many in information that uh, you can get about the data generating process. I have a couple of questions from Zoom first, like two to Sanjay ji and two to G. Uh, uh, so Sanjay ji, uh, 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 someone is asking about, uh, because the name sounds like a politician uh, who comes on TV, so I don't want to take the name. Uh, but uh, <laughs> what is the suitable number of respondents needed uh, 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 to conduct survey for elections and to do political parties use survey data uh, uh, to improve their election chances. Uh, I get a sense that these days political parties are for one election are not getting one survey conducted. Mm -hmm. Simultaneously, they are getting surveys conducted by four, five, six, ten agencies. It all depends upon how many, how much resources you have, and you can imagine bigger the party larger the number of survey agencies which has been hired every all senior people have 
people, politicians in the party have hired their own agencies. Mm -hmm. And I, I know, I have been told by people that they all compare. Ye humara, ye humara, sir. So political parties are in a big way conducting or getting surveys conducted. Politicians are also getting surveys conducted. Second, sample size. See, sample size has a relationship. I keep using with the permission of Axis My India. These days, a company based in Mumbai, Axis My India, Pradeep Gupta, he has got a big name these days about forecasting election. He has been very uh, right in forecasting the number of seats and the number of votes. Likely, the party is likely to win. And he keeps citing out of 68, we have got 64 right, etc. Uh, you just compare their forecast and our forecast, not in seats. We don't forecast seats. We always forecast vote estimates. So you compare Karnataka, go back. Karnataka, Himachal, Uttarakhand, Punjab, Goa, UP, etc., etc. And you look at their sample size and look at our sample size and look at the estimates. We estimated vote share of in Goa, in UP, in Punjab, etc., etc. Our sample size, just to give you an example, UP, we had 7,000 samples, they had 1,30,000. Goa, we had 2,000 samples, they had 20,000, 10,000 samples. Punjab, we had 4,600 samples, they had 46,000 samples. Uh, Uttarakhand, we had 2,600 something, 26, they had 26,000 samples. Was the estimate, our estimate, any way like bad or worse compared to their estimate? No, not at all. In fact, better. All in public domain. Even with a very small sample, 10 times smaller, almost. Goa, Himachal, etc. Et so, what, what advantage do they had over our surveys? The advantage was they could disaggregate the results for constituencies by constituency. So, I keep saying it's about how much sample do you take? If you are celebrating your birthday and you have invited 100 friends, you need a 10 kg cake, 15 kg cake. But if you are only having four, students, four friends, you can do with one kg cake. And if the cake has been prepared using the same material, same method, or though no black forest, taste difference kya hai? which is about slicing it. We would be able to do the analysis of UP into four or five slices, six slices, Eastern UP, ye wo. But we usko not be able to do that cake is small. The big cake order karne ka aapko cost of the cake. If we have to order a cake for 15 kg, बहुत दाम में बहुत अंतर है हमारे पास उतने रिसोर्सेज नहीं है 15 केजी का केक हमारे पास भी रिसोर्सेज दे दीजिए शायद उनसे बड़ा केक ऑर्डर कर लीजिए बड़ा केक ऑर्डर करेंगे और उनसे भी बेहतर करेंगे अगली बार आपके बर्थडे पे जी सो लेट मी दे टू क्वेश्चंस टू यू एंड देयर सम दैट आई विल आंसर बिकॉज़ दे आर इजी and I have told them that I'm using those slices just to make people understand that we, why, what is the difference between big sample and a small sample? What is the advantage and what is the disadvantage? I've told Pradeep ji, I use these slices for studying. And he said, yes, absolutely. And he wrote in his mind, sir, it's just for the forecast. My big sample is fine. Okay. Advantage is. I'm not saying that advantage is not. Advantage is. Bigger the sample, you can actually forecast with much more statistical. Yes. Uh, and disaggregate. Ah, and disaggregate that. So, uh, it, like the smaller, like basically in statistical terms, you need some 1200 uh, to uh, 1200 to estimate the constituency size with 95% confidence. Upper job, you need much more data. Uh, so, Jean, first question is uh, uh, Is your analysis of elite representation and class also applicable to parties like AAP? Uh, I think, right? Uh, uh, and uh, uh, census 2021 has not happened. Yeah. So how do you accurately arrive at data points like population distribution, caste, breakup, rural urban migration, and those kind of things? Okay. So on up, glad someone asked the question. Um, if you uh, remember the recent Punjab election, um, there was a lot of spin 
around this um, candidate uh, 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 a mobile repair shop employee who defeated Prakash Singh Badal, right? And, and it was, of course, meant to be an endearing story, but also a, a demonstration of, of how app was, you know, putting politics upside down and transforming and creating new opportunities. It was an extraordinary story, but it hides the fact that overall, the sociological profile of uh, ARP as a party is as elitist, if not more elitist than other parties. Uh, Sanjay, you're very familiar with you know, daily politics. If you look at the social composition of ARP MLAs, there are actually more overall upper caste and, and, and or belong to dominant group like Jats and Gujarat than even the BJP and, and, and Congress uh, before. Mm -hmm. And for all the claim of incarnating a new form of progressive politics, they also don't provide uh, representation to uh, women or they hardly pro provide representation to um, women. And so there is an old adage you know, in, in politics and we've known that ever since you know, the 1950s and 60s and the work done on the Congress and the Congress system that politics and political strategy first and foremost consist in uh, adapting to local circumstances and co-op local elites. And by and large, throughout history, most parties have actually adhered to that adage. Uh, who those elites are has varied through time, obviously, it's not static, but this principle of elitism has, you know, somewhat um, subsisted. Now, for the uh, census 2021, uh, it is, there's no doubt, it's a huge loss, uh, not just for uh, political analysis, but for policy work uh, generally. Uh, it is a huge blot that, you know, India has not been able to conduct or not willing to conduct uh, uh, the 2021 census. Uh, as far as we are concerned, um, it's not affecting us immediately because all, all work principally is on uh, candidates, political class, political parties. Uh, we don't do uh, constituency profiling. Uh, we do not uh, do uh, electoral behavior. Uh, but um, in an ideal world, we would want to use different sets of data and, and, and combine it, put it together. Right, the kind of work that Nilanjan does, for example, relies on uh, census, uh, census information. And even in the past, when we had the census on a regular basis on you know, every, every 10 years, the, we knew, we know that the data would get pretty old fairly quickly and we had to work with projections and, and it's, it's not a perfect world, but uh, at least the data was there and the quality of the data was, you know, um, undisputed. So there's no doubt that this is a huge loss uh, for everyone who's uh, working with uh, evidence or data in India. Just to add to Jeev's uh, point on census data, see, first, it's very hard to match census data with electoral boundaries, right? Census is released at a very different sort of like units. Election boundaries are very different units, so it's a lot of hard work to basically match this. Second, uh, yes, we don't have 2021, so it's making some of hard work uh, uh, difficult, but there's no argument to basically make that if a particular constituency had, say, 40% urban population, it will change dramatically, right? So in 10 years, over the time, we know things would have changed. Uh, so estimates, like precise estimates would change. But overall patterns are not going to change, right? If, if a constituency had 30% Dalit, it won't suddenly have 70% Dalit. It may even have 28 or 32, right? So that, so that we, we can account for in, some of those In things. some aspect, we can look for alternatives. Mm -hmm. So we have satellite imagery that can be used to make estimates of population density within political boundaries, for example. Mm -hmm. That gives us a much more linear uh, you know, approach or much more linear, you know, uh, approach to uh, urban versus urban rural data, right? Uh, but it's not a substitute for the wealth of data that's contained in the census. Let me take three more questions and then we'll call it a day. Uh, again, but... Sir, one more time, please. After this, we want to go outside. Thank you. Uh, so in uh, Milan Vaishnav writes that a lot of criminalization in politics happens in his book, I think, When Crime Pays, he says that people vote for, uh, you know, uh, 
election i mean legislators with criminal backgrounds not because of their but because of it like that is what is actually driving them to vote for it and he mentions a lot of data even though that data is a little outdated in 2017 2016 i think have you been able to observe something like that is there a growing trend in the criminalization against yes. in politics or yes. and what 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 about the fact that this this line that he says that are people still voting because of the criminalization that's one aspect? argument that's one theory there are other theories as well yeah. that's like he's basically making this argument against uh, a particular set of notion which is that people are not informed about the criminal uh, uh, side of politicians He's saying, no, people in India know if their politicians are criminal. They're actually voting for them because uh, uh, there is a market for criminality. And his argument is because the state is capricious in India, state doesn't function for the poor. These criminal politicians or Bahubali are mimicking the state. They hold those darbars, they call the police wala to help these people. So that's why criminal politicians exist in the system. That's one theoretical line. I have another explanation. Huh? I have another explanation. Please go ahead. Actually, which is actually it connects to something that I said earlier, that you have a political class that is recruited on elite ground. Uh, you have a system that's more and more costly, and and in which those only those who have the resources and the incentives to take those risks, you know, get into uh, politics. And we observe that more and more candidates for major parties uh, declare some form of business. The work I've done in UP, the work Rahul has done in UP, we know what business means. It's mm. basically, it's construction, it's real estate, it's liquor distribution, it's contracting. Every sector of economic activity that is close to the state, dependent on state uh, contract licenses, uh, protection, cash rich, generate a lot of black money, and also sectors of the economy that are heavily you know, um, criminalized. And so uh, this happens to coincide with the pool where candidates are um, selected. And so for me, I don't look at crime. Crime is not an occupation, except for characters like you know, Mukhtar Ansari and a, a few Bahubalis that are known, but crime is just a function of how you conduct your business. Behind crime lies the fact that you have a greater and greater integration of local business networks and, uh, and, and politics. This is where your candidates um, come from. Uh, and that's, that, that's compatible, of course, with Milan's argument or with insights we get from anthropologists mm -hmm. that show that, you know, this uh, Dabang register is something that a lot of voters find also appealing, not just because they like, you know, these, you know, sort of heroic, you know, uh, bad figures, but because it's a signal of strength and, and, and effectiveness in a system that people actually don't have a lot of faith in, right? And so, um, and so I think that also has to do with uh, the kind of uh, pressure that the system creates on who can get into politics. Uh, so there's a question on political consultancy firm. There is going to be a separate session. We will deal it then. Yeah. Uh, when uh, the minority representation was highest, I think, in the 1980s. People have written on this. Just Google Muslim representation on Google images. You'll get graphs and you'll figure out when that's happening. There's a... Uh, and, consult uh, data. Uh, consult data. Uh, and then are candidates uh, getting richer and then getting renomination? Yes, it's a power, they get power story, right? So... Uh, any like one more question, last question, and then no, sir, sir, you know, sir, you know, sir, sir, number five, sorry. Mm -hmm. And then we close it. Interesting session. Um, yeah, you, you spoke about, uh, you know, women uh, voting in larger numbers and coming out and voting and having representation uh, in politics. I just wanted to get a sense of, do you have insights on like what you spoke about, like what demography of women are voting or if there's a certain age or what's the reason for why women are coming out and voting in larger chunks? Uh, two quick responses to that. Uh, in terms of what I remember right now, if I look at in terms of the educational profile, uh, the turnout is low compared to if uh, among the women who are highly educated and among those women who are almost uneducated. But those women who have a very basic education, school education, uh, like, like women who have educated, got education till say ninth, 10th class, school education. They are the ones who are voting out, voting in much bigger number. And the explanation, it is not coming from the data, but explanation that, you know, these are the women who have managed to get educated. 
started writing their name, reading their newspaper. So they're getting more interested about politics. And also they, you know, the aspiration is going up. So aspirational women to want to move up in social ladder, political ladder, etc. So we see that the turnout is highest among women who are who have basic level of education, school educated. Uh, in terms of the reasons why, uh, one is uh, not why, in a sense, there is also the process of, uh, if you look at the reservation for women in the Panchayati Raj, we kept hearing about, we do keep hearing about, you know, Sarpanch Pati, et cetera, et cetera. But we have moved beyond that now, because if you look at the data again, you will figure out that in many states, if the 33% women seats are reserved for women, you will often find that the panchayat would have more than 33% women. If 50% seats are reserved for women, more than 50% women are getting elected. So what is happening is that many women who got elected on a reserved seat, even when the seat gets de-reserved, they are contesting in open seats and they are getting elected. So this whole process of politicization, they have become active in politics, so they have got aspiration. Now they don't want to remain as, you know, stamp, rubber stamp. So I think that is what has contributed to women's active participation or increasing turnout in elections. Besides election commission's effort, I want to give credit to election commission also for that. Mm -hmm. Because last few years, at least last one decade, they have done a lot of work about educating all sections of society, mm -hmm. uh, sensitizing people about how to turn out, how, why it is important to vote. I think these three things have contributed yeah. to the main education. Yes, Vandana and Vignesh, these two are last questions and then we close it today. Everyone. So if you have a name with B, you have a, still have a chance. <laughs> Vandana and Vignesh. Yeah. Okay, I would like to ask a question that if, uh, do you face any problem, if any, in interpreting data when two different data sets are merged? Your two different data sets merge. One has to be very, very careful in merging two data sets. Mm. If you are preparing chai, you can put adarak in chai. You won't put too salt much. in chai. Aap namak nahi milayenge. Namak mila denge to uska swad kharaab ho jayega. Agar adarak milaya, to swad bad sakta hai. So one has to be very careful. What are you merging? Parna, do you have any examples of like what you like when you talk? Huh. Why to? Well, even to like see, like that's why I'm saying merging data. So uh, Pradeep Chipper and Francesca presented their work on local level availability. They have been matching this booth with census data for like four or five years, right? And so it takes a lot of time. It, if you have made mistake in merging, then uh, it will throw different back. So anytime, not just with merging data, even on single data, if the like if you are analyzing, you have to be very cautious in interpreting yeah. any sort of data. Exactly. Right? Like you shouldn't like the the way data analysts are trained is that you should doubt the findings that you are seeing, and especially if it's confirming some of your biases, yeah. recheck. Right, you might have made small errors in in the code that you might have written, right? And so it's not that uh, we wrote a one line of code and some graph came and uh, Eureka moment yeah. and gone. You have to, and that's sometimes we make those errors, right? Yeah. And so so yeah. we try has, to do uh, that. There has to be also possible connections that exist between the data that you merge, right? If you merge um, religion of MLAs and, and rainfall data. You're not going to make these connections, right? Or maybe you'll have because maybe you'll have some positive correlation if you twist the data, you know, if you torture it long enough, mm -hmm. right? But you're not going to go anywhere uh, with that. So before merging to data, so we keep saying start with start with data. Actually, start with a question: What is it that you're looking for, and and what is the evidence that you need is available and that help you, you know, uh, find more evidence or you know. And that that's that that's how that's how probably you should uh, proceed. English short question. Yeah. So, you spoke about uh, 
the political party is having multiple survey places. But one such survey that they do extensively before the run of the election is flat survey. What is the utility or you know of, of what what does I mean what what does it deliver? I mean, or what does it confirm? Because I see uh, in the run-up at least two elect two weeks up to the silent period, there are at least on two three rounds that of flash surveys that they do constituency to constituency levels. Flash, survey. flash, flash survey. Flash, flash, flash survey. Yeah. Flash. So <clears throat> it has become very fashionable to give fashionable names to different kinds of things. One word I have started hearing in many universities is that earlier I used to th hear mixed method of research. These days, what I hear is triangulation. So, this new word I have heard, flash survey. Uh, when it is done close to the actual date of polling, I think they try to create this hawa. Jill has already mentioned earlier, and this also comes out from the survey very, very clearly. Indian voters don't want to waste their vote. I am not able to figure out. So what happens is that if you come up with lots and lots of surveys, this is a very typical Indian voter. Surveys bekar hai, parji hai. But survey bata raha ki wo jitega. So that is why I am very confused. So I will, I am likely to vote for the party which is going to win. I don't want to waste my vote. I think this flash survey, whatever name we may give, I think this serves that purpose. It serves or not, we don't know. We have to check that empirically, but at least that is the whole idea about behind, you know, flood the market with lots and lots of sponsored survey so that people at least these two, three, four, five percent voters, swing voters who, have un who are unable to make up their mind, maybe you are able to swing one percent, half a percent of those voters. Basically, those who have more resources, they will order bigger cake and more cake. Uh, more and they will do it again. One day in the morning, with that, thank you everyone for coming today. Uh, we are meeting again uh, uh, on July 27th for the third uh, iteration of this series and this will continue and I hope some of you will become regular uh, uh, sort of visitors to CPR and uh, we'll yeah, figure yeah. out cake next time instead of just chips. So thank you everyone for coming today. Thank you everyone for going on. Thank you.